Since it's Retro Week over on GMBN, I thought on GMBN Tech, we'd do a bike check on a retro mountain bike. In this case, a Foz LTS dating back to 1994. Let's check this bad boy out. As of all, bike checks will start at the heart of the bike. So of course, we're looking at the frame here. It's a very unique looking frame and quite futuristic, even by today's standards, let alone back to 1994 when this was first available on the market. Now this frame hails from the USA and it's made by Brent Foes of Foes Fabrications. Now the whole thing with this was Brent had a history in off-road truck racing and had a go at basically putting suspension onto a mountain bike at a time when half the bike industry still hadn't got their heads around having front suspension on. And this thing's got a whopping 150 millimeters or six inches of rear wheel travel on the back via this single pivot. Now the most exciting thing is the sort of flying V shape of the front triangle here, if you could call it a triangle. So you've got a regular head tube, a regular seat tube, and two semi-monocoque pieces that are welded down the middle. Now you might also notice it's got a hole up the front here. It's not just for looking cool, it's actually to pull the two sides together to give the structure a bit more rigidity up front. Now it's got quite a high single pivot on here, although it still sits, as you can see, quite along the chain line there. So actually in theory, it should pedal quite well. Now having a single pivot does mean it's a very simplified frame design and it can be stiff, resilient and work quite well. It's based around the Fox Alps 4 shock, which is a classic emulsion design shock. Although this particular orientation isn't working its best, as you might imagine, by today's standards. Now you might notice the cockpit end of the bike here is very different to what we're used to today. Now we used to see in a nice wide bar for control and a nice short stem, the nice twitchy agile handling. The complete opposite here. Because the bike is much shorter, you've got a longer stem to keep your position correct, essentially. And you've got a much narrower bar. The stem in question is 135 millimeters long, which wasn't actually super long back then. It used to go up to about 150 millimeters, if you can imagine that thing. It's an Answer ATAC, quite a classic piece of kit. The bar itself is also made by Answer. It's called the Hyperlite because it was a very lightweight bar. And that's just 540 millimeters wide. Now, you notice it's got some anodized brake levers on here. These are Diacomp SS7s, or actually they might be SS7 mock-ups because they look very similar to them, but I can't be sure if they're real ones or not. They look like they've been drilled out on the clamps here to save a bit of weight, which was something we used to do quite heavily back in the 90s, as well as drilling out cranks, which is, use your common sense, a pretty terrifying thing to do. In addition to that, you might notice that the shifters are very different too. So it's using a grip shift style shifter, but these aren't what we're used to seeing. These are actually made by SAX. They're called the SAX Wavy, and you've got a pair of Yeti handlebar grips, which used to leave ite ite in your hands. Now up to the front end of the bike here, and first thing to say is this RockShox Judy Fork only has 75 millimeters of travel. So a bit imbalanced if you consider that it's got 150 out back. Now, before we get into the fork, I'd like to talk about the headset, which is a Diacomp, a headset. Now Diacomp these days, you will know them as Cane Creek, of course. Now the A headset was the first one of its kind where the stem actually clamped onto the steerer tube rather than having a quill design, it used to go onto the inside of the steerer tube. And in those older steerer tube designs, the steerer tube itself was actually threaded and the headset would screw onto that. It's a much heavier system. So these saved a lot of weight off the front end of a bike. Diacomp was the first company to do this. And although this one doesn't have a standard cap on the top, the original ones actually had plastic top caps on them. And the reason for that was because they didn't have cartridge bearings at the time. They had regular cup and cone bearings and you could easily over preload the bearings damaging the headset. So they had these breakaway caps fitted. So if you did over tighten it, the cap would simply crack. Pretty cool idea back then. But of course, now these days, we're much more used to using cartridge bearings, which are much more reliable for long-term use in a headset. Now the RockShox Judy DH was a phenomenal fork for its time, running on springs and MCU elastomers on the inside. It's a very basic fork, but yet it managed to be very popular in the early days. Now you might have been used to seeing these in Judy Red, but this particular one is black and it's got the Foz Fab stickers or decals running down the fork legs. Now at the time, obviously running 150mm travel out back on 75 on front, it was a bit imbalanced. And actually when you ride this, it doesn't feel too bad, but Brent wasn't actually happy with this. 
and he also wasn't happy with the rate at which the bike industry was developing, so he actually later set out to design his own fork, which was known as the Foes F1. And that was a twin crown fork with adjustable compression and rebound damping. Absolutely phenomenal, and he also had to build his own hub to go with that at the time, which later went onto this very bike. Now you might notice it's got grey tyres on here, so these are Tioga Psycho 2 tyres. Now the original Psycho was a John Tomac signature tyre, uh, he also used to use them in a sort of a butterscotch colour, which is incredibly soft. And one of the earliest soft compound rubber tyres available. The downside to them is the knob will sometimes used to simply tear off. They later made the Psycho 2. They've got a slightly more predictable shoulder pattern on them, but the same classic chevron tread on the top of the tyre there. A little bit of tyre history for you. The wheels themselves are Bontrager Weimann rims. Bontrager used to be an independent brand back in the 90s and the hubs made by Ringlay. Absolutely sought after beautiful works of purple and eyes art. Now, unlike today's bikes where we used to seeing powerful and predictable disc brakes, we were stuck with cantilevers back in the 90s. Now, if you look carefully on this bike, you'll notice it's a bit mismatched. There's a V-brake on the back that isn't a period brake. The Scott self-energizing brakes that were on the back actually had a crack in, so I had to remove that and fit an XT V-brake in order to use this on that retro versus modern shoot over on GMBM but up front it's got a classic Suntour XC brake. So it's a regular cantilever design, relying on soft compound pads to basically grip onto the rim, and of course just mechanical leverage to uh, give you the braking power as such, uh, of which it didn't have much back then. Now down to the back end of the bike, firstly I just have to draw attention to the shape of the frame once more. Note how the top tube almost slopes down the opposite way to the bikes we ride today. Completely different in styling, yet it still manages, I think, to look quite futuristic. The back end, of course, big single pivot back on here, leading you down to the rear hub. The rear hub is also made by Ringlay, and although they did make cassette hubs, this is actually a classic screw-on block. Um, kind of what we had to run back then before the advances of Shimano bringing in hyperglide systems, which used the classic cassette-style design that we're used to today. Now, the screw-on hubs, unfortunately, they just weren't quite as good as what we're lucky enough to have today because they didn't have the bearing support on the free hub side of the wheel. The free hub body screwed on and you only had two bearings were actually offset to the left hand side of the bike or the non drive side. So really you're quite more prone to actually breaking rear axles than you are today with a much better system because there's four bearings spread across that axle. Now although XTR M900 rear derailleur is seen on this bike, which had eight speed at the time. This is actually running seven speed. You had the ability to do it back then because the spacing was the same between the gears. Now I'm sure whoever owned this bike originally would love to have had the full eight speed on it, but clearly this is what they chose. And that's another good point to bring with any retro bike. In this era, everyone was kind of vying to have their bike look the most custom, look the trickiest. You might notice there's a lot of purple anodizing on this bike, which some people are actually offended by, but being a child of the era where I couldn't afford these bikes, I think it looks absolutely amazing. Well, I've got to say this stuff was never as good as the real deal from Shimano. They, made, they managed to nail it first time around with everything they did, and I think they largely do that still today. Now, these days, we're much more used to having a one by transmission on bikes, but back then, because you had limited gears on the back, you used to have to have a triple chain set up front. And here you've got a 24, 34, and a massive 46. Now this bike actually used to be raced for downhill back in the day and people used to run up to 54 tooth chain rings. Can you imagine trying to spin out one of those things? How fast you'd be going on a bike like this? That's absolutely bonkers. The cranks though, more importantly, made by Cook Brothers, absolutely stunning. They were on a shopping list, like a want list for everyone back in the 90s and they still look just as nice now, I reckon. Now back in the 90s, the saddle to have, no doubt, was the Celitalia Flight. Now this is a slightly different model and a bit more lurid, but it's kind of acceptable because this one is the Nitrox, which is the Missy Jovi signature edition, as you can see by the graphics on the top and the Kevlar shoulders on there. It's designed to be a little bit tough when you fell off the bike because the Kevlar, of course, wouldn't tear when you bashed it around. It's kind of a bit minging and kind of cool at the same time. The post though is quite interesting because this is made by USC, also known as Ultimate Sports Engineering. British company used to make posts in 420 and 330 mil options, but the posts were always the same size, 27.2 in diameter. Very simple, and you just used to have a shim to make them compatible with your frame. Nice and simple, highly sought after, and they look cool. There we go, hope you enjoyed this retro bike check. If there's anything else you wanna know about this bike, or you've got any requests for other retro bikes for me to do bike checks on, let us know in those comments down there. 
If you want to see me riding this bike, click down here. And if you want to see some of the stuff that's going over on GMBN's Retro Week, click up there. As always, don't forget to give us a huge thumbs up here at GMBN Tech, and don't forget to click that subscribe button.